Good morning. We are going to discuss marbling and adipocyte development, genetics, and nutrition in this talk. The first thing I want to say is that when we are looking at diets to enhance marbling, we have to know what we're feeding. In this example of this feed, crude protein was 29.85%. However, available protein was only 24.68%. That's 17.4% less crude protein available to the animal. So when I am formulating diets using byproducts that have been heated and dried, I always use available crude protein in my diet formulation rather than crude protein. The second thing we have to understand about animals that are not under exceptionally stressful situations is that there is a hierarchy of nutrient use. That goes maintenance, development, growth, lactation, reproduction, and fattening. It's also important to understand that 80 to 85% of a ruminant animal's total feed intake is used for maintenance before any lean tissue growth or marbling deposition can occur. The next thing that we need to understand is how the rumen volatile fatty acid production varies with the diets that are fed. In this chart, if in the upper left hand, where it is 100% forage diet, the resulting VFAs in rumen fermentation are approximately 71% acetate, 16% propionate, and 8% butyrate. As we move on down to a 20% forage, 80% grain diet, acetate moves from that 71% down to about 53%. Propionate nearly doubles, going from 16% to almost 31%. And butyrate stays relatively the same, going from 8 to 10.7%. So the main thing to notice here is that the more forage we have as a percentage of the diet, the greater the acetate and the lower the propionate. Then as we add grain to the diet, acetate goes down, never going below 50%, but propionate doubles, going to about 31%. So acetate is used primarily in fatty acid synthesis for back fat, seam fat, and milk fat. Propionate, on the other hand, is converted to glucose. Butyrate goes to fatty acid synthesis for fat cells and in the mammary gland. However, diet affects the rate and end products of rumen fermentation in a way that high concentrate grain-based diets result in increased propionate production relative to acetate. Propionate is the only VFA that's converted to glucose in the liver. And this is important because higher levels of glucose production in the liver result in a greater average daily gain, more lean tissue growth per day, and more intramuscular fat or marbling. So the methods that we have of increasing propionate production are to increase the rate of passage of feed by processing feed to reduce particle size, increase the rate of fermentation of the feed by feeding more grain or processing the grain, such as grinding or steam flaking. Both of these result in a pH decrease when feeding more grain. And because the bacterial species that produce propionate survive better in a lower rumen pH, this increases propionate production. In the United States, in commercial feeding operations, we also use ionophores, such as menensin, trade name rumensin, or lasalicid, trade name bovitec, which select against gram-positive rumen bacteria that produce greater amounts of acetate, thus a shift to more propionate producers. Now, we need to understand something about fat cell growth. Fat cells undergo hypertrophy or cell filling by 100 to 200 days of age. And these fat cells are also highly active between nine to 11 months of age. So if I am looking at marbling 
and I have cattle backgrounded on forage or grass between that nine to 11 months of age, we need to keep in mind that the acetate that is produced provides 70 to 80% of the acetyl units for back fat, but only 10 to 25% of the acetyl units for marbling. Therefore, diet has a huge impact. We also need to know that seam fat is the largest depot in the animal, accounting for approximately 16.5% of the, the total weight of an animal. So from a fat standpoint, it is very high. If we look at where seam fat is deposited, it is the highest in the rib and the chuck, followed by the loin, and finally, the lowest amount of seam fat is in the round. Well, why is this seam fat important? This is a cutout of a steer with, that had a yield grade two. And what I want you to do is I want you to look on the right side of this slide to figure six that shows the chuck. All of that seam fat needs to be removed. It is a high cost product, to remove because it takes a lot of labor. Consumers don't want that fat. And one of the reasons that we receive premiums for yield grade one, potentially yield grade two versus yield grade five carcasses is that if you look at the chuck on a yield grade five carcass, that's just an excessive amount of fat to have to remove. So the thing to keep in mind is we are feeding high grain diets to get this marbling because high grain results in more propionate, which results in more glucose, which results in more marbling. So what at grind of corn is best? <clears throat> Whole shelled corn is very good up to about 15% fiber. Coarsely ground corn is good between 15 and 30% fiber. And then we have smaller grinds of corn. I would never feed corn as fine as the bottom two pictures on this page. Keep in mind, this, these pictures came from corn that was all ground through a roller mill at exactly the same settings for the flow and for the thickness. However, the bottom two pictures are from corn that came from the field relatively wet and had to be dried heavily. Starch in grain is a crystalline structure. When we have to put heat to corn in order to dry it, that crystalline structure cracks. When we grind that corn with cracks in the crystalline structure of starch, it shatters and we end up with way too much surface area and way too fine of particles. And we have to understand that bacteria digest by attaching to the surface of a feed. So when I have a lot of starch that is in very fine particles, I can lead to acidosis because the bacteria can digest it too quickly, dropping the pH in the rumen. So let's look at what kind of processing is best. And for this, I just want to focus on corn. This is an analysis done by Fred Owens, and even though it was done a long time ago, it's still valid today. He looked at studies that had over 16,000 total cattle for corn. And he looked at what form of corn, dry roll, high moisture, steam rolled, or steam flaked whole, or reconstituted, had on feed intake. Dry rolled corn had the greatest feed intake. The lowest feed intake was actually with steam flake corn with high moisture corn and whole corn being intermediate. You know, when we looked at average daily gain, the lowest average daily gain came from high moisture corn whereas dry rolled corn, steam rolled corn, and whole corn were the same. So why was high moisture corn lower? Whenever we ferment high moisture corn, we are using the energy from the starch to fermentation. 
So as we produce acids from that starch during fermentation, it loses energy. When we look at feed efficiency, dry rolled corn and high moisture corn did not result in as great a feed efficiency as either steam rolled or steam flaked corn or whole corn. So part of the problem with high moisture corn, as I've already said, is the loss of total energy in the corn through the fermentation. With dry rolled corn, we need to look back to our pictures and keep in mind that when we don't control particle size, we have a greater chance of acidosis. Some work that was done in the mid 90s by Butcherman and others looked at corn, barley, and wheat fed as whole unprocessed grain in 100% concentrate diets. And they found that corn does not necessarily need to be processed to result in high levels of starch digestibility, whereas the smaller grains do. In fact, young cattle between three months and a year of age tend to chew their corn and break it up very well. So even when we feed whole corn to a steer that might weigh 700 pounds, by the time that corn hits the rumen, most of it is in the form of a coarsely cracked corn. So since glucose provides most of the structural backbone for intramuscular fat or marbling, and if we are feeding diets that have less processed corn, such as whole corn, we need to understand that some of that starch escapes the, the rumen and reticulum and ends up in the small intestine. And all that this graph shows is that steers can absorb glucose from about 700 grams of starch entering the small intestine. That starch that enters the small intestine is broken down by amylase and then maltase to release glucose, and it's the glucose that's absorbed. We don't get this starch absorption from the small intestine when we have high moisture. I'm sorry, we have steam flake corn because 99% of the starch is digested in the rumen. However, when we're looking at marbling, this glucose that's absorbed through the small intestine is a very good thing because it is more efficient to absorb glucose through the small intestine than it is to have it broken down to propionate and then converted to glucose in the liver. So now let's look at fat cell development. One of the reasons that we are so concerned about intramuscular fat is that the more intramuscular fat we have, the less of an undesirable eating experience consumers have. And so as beef is a high priced product and we want consumer acceptability, we pay more for higher quality beef products. This is just a slide of the amount of marbling that goes into the USDA quality grades. And for small, which would be low choice, that's about four to 5.7% intramuscular fat. The slightly abundant prime has 99 .9 to 12.2% fat. In contrast, with the Japanese grading scale, most of our high prime or that is around 12.5% intramuscular fat comes out to a four to maybe a five on the Japanese grading scale. The reason for this difference is the Japanese grading scale is based upon Wagyu cattle that have a completely different genetic capability to have intramuscular fat or marbling compared with our British breeds. This picture illustrates a USDA prime ribeye on the left versus Wagyu steaks on the right that would be a grade eight to 10. So <clears throat> what this shows is the Japanese beef marbling score as a function of extractable lipid in the loin eye area. And as we see, Prime has around 12% fat, intramuscular fat. If we go on out and we look at a BMS score of eight, 
that's going to have about 22 to 24 percent extractable fat from the loin eye. The Wagyu cattle are significantly different. This graph shows Japanese black and Charlie by Japanese black crossbred cattle. The light blue graph on the bottom would be very similar to what we see with Angus cattle in that we level off in intramuscular capability, whereas high grading Wagyu cattle have the ability to keep putting down intramuscular fat the longer that they are on feed. Part of the reason for this is shown in this graph and the blue lines are Wagyu, the red are Angus. And all that it shows on the far right is that the intramuscular fat cells from Wagyu have more than twice as much DNA as in Angus. So there are differences in the fat cells. Fat cell growth needs to be understood if we're going to look at enhancing marbling. Fat cells start to fill by 100 to 200 days of age, and they are highly active between 9 to 11 months of age. So if I have a steer in a feedlot by seven or eight months of age, and it's on a high grain diet by nine to 11 months of age, that high grain diet is going to be producing a lot of propionate, which is going to result in more glucose, which means those animals are already marbling. In contrast, if I wean calves at seven months of age and I turn them out onto grass and background them for three months, those calves are going to be consuming a forage-based diet the results in much more acetate, only half as much propionate, and they're not going to be marbling as well as their counterparts that are in the feedlot. Because acetate provides 70 to 80% of the backbone for back fat, but only 10 to 25% of the acetyl unit backbone for intramuscular fat. So, Propionate provides 50 to 70% of the structural backbone for marbling, but only 1 to 10% of the acetyl units for subcutaneous fat. The remaining 20 to 40% of acetyl units for marbling come from glucose absorbed in the small intestine. And we have to understand that mammals lack the enzymes necessary to convert acetate to glucose. So once that forage is digested, and acetate is produced, that acetate can only go to fat. It can't go to glucose because the mammal lacks the enzymes necessary to convert it. Therefore, genetics, days on a high grain diet with appropriate fermentation, determine marbling. Age is nearly irrelevant. Looking at some graphs at the influence of back fat on quality grade, if we are looking at prime, we really need to hit that seven tenths of an inch to be assured that we get prime cattle. Now, can, it, can an animal grade prime if at four tenths of an inch if it has exceptional genetics? Yes, absolutely. But these are large data sets and normally we're looking at about seven tenths of an inch to get prime cattle. If we are looking at CAB, the upper two thirds of choice, we're looking somewhere around that half an inch to six tenths of an inch. And keep in mind, this back fat is measured between the 12th and the 13th rib along the loin eye three quarters of the way down from the dorsal process. So we're looking at this the same place that it, that carcass would be graded. If we are looking at low choice, we can get the low choice at about four tenths of an inch of back fat. If we are looking at select, it is completely reversed. Very trim cattle, very little back fat, result in more select cattle because select cattle have very little marbling. As we go up and the percentage of select go down, the percentage of choice and prime go up. So let's look at the impact of days on feed on marbling. 
Smith at Texas A&M in 1995 predicted that cattle needed to be on feed 167 to 236 days and be 835 to 945 pounds before fat self formation began. However, in that study, the cattle were 265 days of age when they started in the feedlot, which meant that they had to be 14 to 16 months old before they were predicted to begin marbling. And historically, there has been this notion that cattle had to have some age before they went into the feedlot to begin marbling. However, in the last 20 years, that has changed significantly. Work done at the University of Illinois looked at weaning steers at 117 days of age, feeding them a high grain diet for 268 days of age when they were slaughtered at 394 days of age, which is 13 months. Those cattle graded 89% low choice or higher with 56% in the upper two thirds of the choice grade. Work done at Ohio State looked at weaning steers at 103 days of age, feeding them a high grain diet for 282 days before they were harvested at 385 days of age. Those cattle graded 85% low choice or higher with 60% in the upper two thirds of the choice grade. And the bottom right hand corner is a picture of a loin eye from a 12 month old prime animal. So, research has shown that cattle can grade choice anywhere from 13 to 26 months of age. Diet, management, genetics determine whether an animal will grade choice within this age range. In fact, many of the papers that have reported that cattle needed to be a certain age to grade choice already started with yearlings that had been on forage-based diets until a year of age or more. In fact, Many animals that do not grade choice at an advanced stage probably would have graded choice at a younger age under management and diet strategies used to have a high grain diet earlier in life. Current research at Ohio State is showing high levels of dietary vitamin A reduce marbling by nearly 30%. So what about creep feeding? Well, creep feeds usually have an efficiency of around eight to one. So if your creep feed costs $250 a ton, that's 12 and a half cents per pound times eight equals a dollar for each additional pound of gain. Creep feeds need to be 16 to 18% crude protein because they're fed at a time when normally forage quality and the, is going down and the lactation curve on the dam is going down so it provides more energy and more protein. Research has shown that creep feeding does enhance marbling, and it may be important to some branded programs and cost effective for producers who are retaining ownership of their cattle, especially producers that are selling freezer beef or going for selling prime cattle. This is a, just a picture of the loin eye from a 12 month old steer. This animal was actually 364 days of age. Weighed 1,270 pounds with a 765 pound hot carcass weight, a 13 and a half square inch ribeye, and it was slightly abundant, a prime yield grade two. So now let's take a little look at animal health and look at the role it plays in determining carcass characteristics and eating characteristics. Work done at Clay Center, Nebraska, in one study showed that 35% of steers were treated for a respiratory disease. Of those cattle, 78% of the treated cattle have lung lesions, and 68% of the untreated cattle have lung lesions. Lung lesions occur when an animal gets pneumonia. It's small tears in the lung. If an animal is sick enough to be identified and treated, performance reducing lung damage has already occurred. However, this study showed that 68% of untreated cattle have lung lesions. The reason for this is that not all cattle that are sick or have pneumonia either exhibit signs or are noticed. So 
lung lesions from respiratory disease in another study were present in 30% of steers at harvest. The major findings of this were that steers with lung lesions have lower average daily gains, lighter carcass weights, deposited less internal fat and in marbling, and have less tender steaks than animals without lung lesions. When an animal has pneumonia and is repairing lung lesions, it appears that we get a lot more collagen cross-linking occurring throughout the body, which can cause tougher stakes. So in practice, if I am trying to keep cattle healthy and I am running a feedlot or I have newly weaned calves that have been bawling and may not have eaten for a day or two, the minute a truck arrives at the feedlot, I want a water tank with sodium and potassium salts and B vitamins, because the one thing I know these newly arrived calves are going to do is drink. I don't know whether they're going to eat for a day or two as they establish a new dominance order within the group and as they walk the pens and figure out what a feed bunk is. So I want to provide electrolytes to calves immediately off the truck in the feedlot. Another thing to consider is what do I do when I have cattle that I pull because I think they are sick, but they don't have a temperature of 103 degrees. Normally these cattle have been observed to be off feed or are hanging back and not coming to the feed bunk when the feed truck goes by, which is why they are being pulled. I use a number of different products that help to put the rumen back in order from the standpoint of providing vitamins, minerals, B vitamins. The thing with B vitamins is that the animal only produces it when it's eating. B vitamins are produced by the rumen bacteria. So if I have an animal that is not eating for three or four days in the feedlot, I'm not getting B vitamin production. B vitamins are critical for several functions, including muscle function, but one of the main side effects of a B vitamin deficiency is that cattle don't want to eat. So when I pull animals through the chute, I want to give them something, whether it's a drench of electrolytes or a product that contains minerals and B vitamins, because that animal was sick enough to be identified, to just take its temperature, find out that it's under 103 degrees and turn it back out is just more stress with no benefit. So the implications of this, genetics, diet, and management all impact the final carcass characteristics of animals. Too often animals are managed in a way that results in their not being able to achieve their genetic potential and feedlots should be treated as hotels where the animals are guests. Any animal must be healthy and well-fed to achieve its marbling potential. Now I wanna look at some Japanese feedlot pictures. In Japan, the feedlots are designed so that they stay dark. There's diffused light and the reason for this is there is very little vitamin D coming from the sun in these types of barns. Vitamin D has a sparing effect on vitamin A, and we're going to discuss vitamin A a great deal. So in Japanese feedlots, they eliminate as much of the sunlight as possible. They feed a high grain diet, and as you see, the diet in the feed bunk is basically yellow colored. There is no green leafy material in here. And this all relates back to vitamin A because the beta carotene in green leafy plants, the precursor of vitamin A, is an antagonist to marbling. Marbling and seam fat are significantly different. They have different origins, metabolic, yeah, or embryologically, they have different precursors metabolically. And so in Japan, they try to limit vitamin A and vitamin D 
in their feedlot studies. Milton Gorosika Bunfil, who conducted his PhD at Ohio State, conducted four studies in which cattle were not supplemented with vitamin A for between 145 and 243 days. Three of the four studies reported increases in quality grade with no supplemental vitamin A. Two of the four reported increases in marbling score, yield grade, and back fat did not change. Only one of the four studies reported a decrease in average daily gain in feed efficiency with reduced vitamin A. Carrie Pickworth Poole, who conducted her research at Ohio State, looked at the impact of not including vitamin A in finishing diets for beef cattle. The NRC recommendation for vitamin A is 2200 international units of vitamin A per kilogram of diet. We need to understand that most of the feeds that we have, especially green leafy feeds, have this much vitamin A. So when we supplement additional vitamin A, what we're really doing is we are oversupplying vitamin A to the animal. In Dr. Poole's studies, it took 56 days for retinol concentration is the retinol form of vitamin A that's stored in the animal. It took two months to relatively deplete those liver stores. The blue line on the bottom here shows NA was no vitamin A, and these animals were fed for 227 days. Versus the other lines on top, the purple line that had supplemental A for all 227 days. And what we see here is that at day 56, it started to separate. And by the end, there was a significant difference in the blood circulating levels of serine retinol due to vitamin A restriction. The very bottom portion of this graph that has IM, that's intramuscular fat. What we see with, again, the blue line is that there is significantly less retinol in the fat of animals that were not supplemented with vitamin A. The key thing here is that animal health was not impacted because that receiving period where animals are stressed are in the first 56 days where liver stores of retinol were, su were sufficient to meet requirements. Well, they also looked at the carotenoid levels in feedstuffs. Keep in mind, carotenoids, beta carotene, they're the precursors of vitamin A. What was found was that forage, such as fescue pasture, had tremendous amounts of vitamin A equivalents, even higher than orchard grass hay and alfalfa hay. Straw, on the other hand, was very, very low. Corn silage was higher than some of the haze, but has the benefit of providing additional energy because on a dry matter basis, corn silage is half corn. However, if I look at what's done in Japan, all of the forage that is fed in Japan where they keep quite a uh, an eye on vitamin A levels is straw because it has the lowest amount of vitamin A equivalents. If I look at corn, I see high moisture corn having the highest level of carotenoids. That is because they are only destroyed with heat and pressure. So dry corn, dry whole shelled corn, cracked corn, steam flake corn, they're all subject to heat destroys a lot of the vitamin A. High moisture corn maintains its vitamin A level. If I look at co-products that we feed, wet distillers grains have a much higher vitamin A concentration than dry distillers grains. 
soybean meal has a very, very low level. So if I am looking at Stiller's grains versus soybean meal as a protein source, and I am trying to restrict my vitamin A equivalents that are in the diet, especially if I am in an area of the Midwest where I'm feeding corn silage, I choose soybean meal over to Stiller's grains. So Dr. Pickworth's overall findings were that the corn-based finishing diets without supplemental vitamin A met the cattle's vitamin A requirement for growth and health, improved carcass quality by decreasing vitamin A inhibition, also found that intramuscular and subcutaneous fat deposits are independently regulated and there are adipogenic genes that are involved in this that are being investigated further. Thank you.